Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at our Sustainable Seafood Expo. And thank you for coming to this special panel where you're going to be hearing some experts about sustainable seafood in many different aspects. This expo is something that we want people to start a conversation. We want them to be thinking about where their seafood is coming from. When you eat your seafood, is what you're eating today not going to be jeopardizing the populations or the environment that we get that seafood from in the future? That's really what it's all about today. The panelists that you see behind me are going to be talking about many different aspects of that, and I hope you're looking forward to them as much as I am. So now, I'm going to uh, introduce and hand the mic over to Dr. Stephen Murray, who will be the moderator of this panel. Thank you so much for coming today, and I hope you enjoy the panel. Dr. Murray. Thank you, Mike. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We're so happy that you're here. Uh, I think we have a very exciting program, and by exciting, I mean, I think we have a very interesting topic that is near and dear to the hearts of those of you that have attended today's event. And I think we've assembled a, a group of panelists here who bring a great deal of expertise from different perspectives on this subject. Now, first of all, I'd like to start off by letting you know that this particular panel is being uh, sponsored by Alta Sea. Alta Sea is uh, redeveloping 35 acres here in the Port of Los Angeles into an ocean-based innovation center bringing together science, business, and education with the goal of generating solutions to some of our greatest challenges. Uh, Alta Sea is looking at building a state-of-the-art science hub and to use this hub to bring together some of the world's leading researchers to advance understanding of the ocean. The business hub is designed to support firms who are interested in commercializing ocean-related breakthroughs and emerging technologies, and the Education Hub is designed to ignite worldwide interest in the ocean's indispensable role in our lives, and particularly to look at the local community here and all the educational efforts we can bring to bear. Alta Sea is going to be a catalyst, we think, to unlocking the ocean's potential. And this particular science hub at Alta Sea is going to be populated and directed by some of Southern California's top scientists from institutions like the University of Southern California, the University of California, Los Angeles, the California State University campuses in the region, and Occidental College. So I'd like to start off first by introducing our panelists. Um, and then we're going to turn this over to them because they have the information that I know that all of you are going to benefit from. So first of all, let's start off with get my notes here. Craig Heberer on the far left here. Craig is a fourth generation Croatian American born and raised in San Pedro, California. His great grandfather, his grandfather and his uncles were all commercial tuna fishermen, and his brother Chris is an active, active commercial squid and tuna fisherman. Craig has a bachelor's degree in fishery sciences from Humboldt State University, and a master's degree in biological oceanography from the University of Puerto Rico School of Marine Science. Now, Craig has spent the last 18 years working as a fisheries biologist for the National Marine Fisheries Service in Long Beach. Craig currently serves as the West Coast Recreational Fisheries Coordinator for the Fisheries Service. Next to Craig here, we have Bob Bertelli. Now, Bob is a local fisherman from the San Pedro region. He's currently the vice chairman of the California Sea Urchin Commission. Bob served as a policy advisor to the California Lobster and Trap Fishermen's Association, and he was a member uh, of the Marine Life Protection Act initiative for the South Coast region. This is a group that did a lot of the hard work in placing marine protected areas in Southern California. Bob currently serves as a Southern California trustee for the California Fisheries Coalition. He has also organized commercial sea urchin diver participation with the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission's 
Palos Verdes Kelp Restoration Project, where he's worked with Mr. Tom Ford. And he has worked with politicians, state regulators, scientists, and environmental NGOs towards the goal of sustaining California's fisheries. Next, we have Cassin Trainer. Cassin has worked to support stewardship of our marine resources across the globe. He co-founded the world's first sustainable sushi restaurant, San Francisco's Tataki Sushi and Sake Bar, in 2008. In an effort to bring sustainable sushi deeper into the American foodscape, Cassin authored Sustainable Sushi, a guide to saving the oceans one bite at a time. And by the way, there are copies of that book that will be available for you to put an order in for. Uh, we can tell you afterwards exactly how to do that. Uh, Cassin was awarded the title Hero of the Environment by Time Magazine in 2010, and he received a congressional commendation in the Ocean Protection Hero Award from the environmental organization Save Our Shores. Trenner held the position of seafood team leader with Greenpeace USA. He designed, executed, and won campaigns, both confrontational and cooperative, to improve seafood operations of major companies such as Costco, Trader Joe's, Target, Walmart, and Safeway. Trenner is a frequent commentator on sustainable seafood issues and has been featured in regional, national, and international media outlets. Born in Washington State and living in San Francisco, he speaks five languages. He holds a master's degree in international environmental policy from the Environmental Institute of International Studies, and he received a bachelor's degree in political science from Hobart College. Lastly, and immediately to my left, is Nora Eddy from Salta, Salty Girl Seafood. And Nora has worked in and on the water for most of her life. She spent countless days at sea and working in fisheries all over the world. She's an avid surfer and all around water woman. Her passion for fisheries stems from an upbringing in a small New England town and led her to completing her master's degree, working to improve the Galapagos lobster fishery at the University of California, Santa Barbara's Bren School of environmental science and management. She did that degree in 2014 and immediately launched Salty, Geese, Salty Girl Seafood with her co-founder, Laura Johnson. And Salty Girl Seafood has the aim of creating positive change in the seafood industry. In addition to her work with Salty Girl, she currently manages an international fisheries and marine spatial planning project. So this, folks, represents our panelists. Now I'm gonna start off. I, I think a rather esteemed group, don't you think? So we're gonna start off by asking each of them to spend two minutes answering a simple question from their perspective. And that question is, what is sustainable seafood? And we're gonna start with Craig. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate the introductions and to my fellow panelists. It's a pleasure to be up here with you and thank you all for coming to San Pedro, the birthplace of the U.S. tuna industry. I don't know if those of you had a chance to see my presentation earlier, but this is a special place in terms of its history and heritage and fisheries has a long running um, legacy here in, in, in San Pedro. And uh, I was born and raised here and as Stephen mentioned, uh, uh, from a commercial fishing family. Um, and have been working with the National Marine Fisheries Service now for about 18 years. Um, we have a booth here at the show. It's uh, NOAA Fisheries. Uh, it's another of our names. We're a line office with NOAA, with the Weather Service and the Ocean Service. Um, Amber Rhodes is here in the audience. Amber, raise your hand. She's uh, staffing the booth. So if you have any follow-up questions on any of the topics today, Amber is uh, w uh, capable and ready to answer uh, your questions. So when I was told that this would be the opening, question asked the panelists, it, it kind of cracked a smile for me because our division that we work in is the Sustainable Fisheries Division in the National Marine Fisheries Service. So everything we do is based on sustainability. And as a science-based agency, I'm a resource manager and a biologist. Um, that has been the mantra of what we do in trying to manage our domestic U.S. fisheries uh, in terms of sustainability. So 
Sustainable seafood on the U.S. government side, working with industry and partners, means you have a stock or a species that you are either eating in a restaurant or buying from a fish market or trying here at the show. If it's from a U.S. fishery, it has to be sustainably managed under 10 federal statutes that we call our national standard guidelines. So when you buy a piece of U.S. seafood, you can be rest assured that we have been working to, one, make sure that the stock status of those species are sustainable, that they're not overexploited and overfished. Uh, since about the year 2000, we've rebuilt 30, 37 stocks of fish uh, throughout the nation. So we have been real big focus point of rebuilding these fisheries. So there are about currently about 8% of the managed stocks that we have in the U.S. fisheries are considered overfished. Um, and, a, and another 16% are, are overfishing. And these are two terms that we use to say that the fisheries that are catching these fish are either catching too many of them or they, there's not enough spawning fish in the population. So what we do at that point is we have a rebuilding schedule where we, we, we cut back on the number of boats and the number of sets and the landings and we have a schedule for rebuilding that population. And so one of the things we try to do is, is not only work with the species and the environment through the ecosystem management but also with the fishermen, the communities and the ports. So social economic aspects of sustainability is as important to the economy of the U.S. and the welfare of our working men and women as what we do to maintain the stocks and the habitat. They all work together. You can't have them separate. And so you have, for example, um, situations where you can shut fisheries out altogether and say we shouldn't be fishing on them even or we can have rebuilding plans that allow the communities to still maintain their focus. Thank you, thank you. We're now gonna hear from Nora. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry, it's a little tight back here. Um, so at Salty Girl, we think about sustainable seafood and sustainable fisheries in, in kind of three different ways. First, we look at, um, are there enough fish in the water? You know, what is the population? Is this a healthy, abundant resource as a whole? Then we think about what is the interaction between the way that we're harvesting the fish, um, whether it's the, the fishermen or, or the gear type, what is the interaction with the habitat, the marine habitat for other marine organisms, and what is the interaction with other living organisms, which is what in the industry we call bycatch. Um, and then kind of lastly, we think about it from um, a socioeconomic uh, perspective um, are we fishing sustainably in terms of are we extracting the most value out of this resource that, that we can be? Are we keeping people working? Are we keeping working waterfronts act and active and vibrant? Um, but something that we were talking about or we talk about a lot as a company as well is the importance of traceability when you're talking about sustainability. Um, we have this huge problem of mislabeling in the seafood industry, which many of you are aware of. Um, one third of all seafood sold in the U.S is mislabeled and very rampant here in Southern California. 58% of seafood sold in this region is mislabeled. And so traceability is very important when you're talking about sustainability because if you don't know where your fish is coming from and how it was harvested, you really have no way of tracking it back to a sustainable source. Thank you, Norm. Okay, Cassidy. Very good. Hi, everybody. Uh, I first would really like to thank all the seed for making this happen. Pat, Kate, Sarah, the rest of the team there are doing a great job, and Steve, thank you very much. But most importantly, I want to thank the gentleman here to our right who's physically holding this air duct <laughs> to keep us cool. Thank you so much. You may want to get the first couple rows. Yeah, I think they could use it. Um, my, my fellow panelists have really covered a lot of what I would have said, uh, talking about the theoretics and the, the science behind seafood sustainability. So I guess I'll go at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, I believe food is sacred, and I believe eating is a spiritual practice. And seafood sustainability for me is about approaching food in that manner. It's what happens when we bring our heart into our decisions in terms of how we eat when it comes to seafood. For a very long time, we've been very disconnected from the seafood industry as consumers. And it's nobody's fault. It's just the way that it happened. It, we caught fish in a different world. You know, what happens in the ocean and the way that it was received on land were just completely two different galaxies. 
Uh, but we have different opportunities now. We have new technology. We have more information. We have better connection. We have all sorts of ways, and tools that we can connect those dots. And as such, we as consumers have access to so much more data that allows us to really take responsibility for the impacts of our choices. I think when we eat with a whole heart, when we eat really understanding the ramifications of the choices that we're making, we feed ourselves in a much more healthy and fulfilling way. So for me, seafood sustainability is what happens organically when we approach fish from the idea that we want to be responsible. We don't want to pass externalities onto the planet anymore. We want to feel good about what we do. And um, it just goes from there. Thank you, Cassie. Let's hear from Bob. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on this panel. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, I enjoy the opportunity. I've been a commercial fisherman now for 40 years. In that 40 years, I've seen tremendous changes take place in the way we manage our resources out in the ocean. Most of those changes are very positive. When I first got into this business, it was unheard of for fishermen to go to the regulatory agency and say, hey, we need more controls on us. Much of what you see in the reduction of harvest in our local fisheries, and by local I mean the state of California, has been the result not of just diminished stocks, it's been the result of regulatory action to cut down on the amount of seafood we take out of the ocean to keep it a sustainable level. And every year I see more and more fishermen buying into this philosophy. Fishermen do not want to put themselves out of business, right? Part of the job of the environmental community is to make sure we don't. The, the science community needs, <laughs> needs to make sure that we have the right tools to work with. And having the right tools to work with means that we have to, one of the things we have to do is we have to set aside certain parts of the ocean that we don't go into and harvest. That was what the Marine Life Protection Act initiative was all about. Now we can sit here and argue about particular places that we closed and left open, but the thing is, is that we took positive action and over the years, we'll go back, we'll real evaluate these things, but to make sure that we have sustainable seafood, sustainable seafood also means we have to have sustainable fishermen. 90% of our fish now that is, is imported into this country. Some of this is from questionable sources. Right? Some of you know if you have animals, some of the pet food that comes in from out of, the, out of the country has been known to damage or kill animals. Here in California, we have a good system of monitoring seafood. Yes, there is a labeling problem. The good news is, is that people are working on solving these labeling problems. So, this has this, so it's very important that we sustain fishermen, that we have responsible fishermen. And we're getting there. We're trying to get rid of any bad apples that we have. Believe me, we work closely with the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, to support enforcement issues. And it's, we're getting there. We're getting there real fast. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So, we're going to ask now each of the panelists to take about five minutes and to amplify on an individual issue or two that they feel would be the most important message to leave with you. Now, after we have the panelists have this opportunity, then we're going to take some questions from you guys in the audience before we wrap up. So, Fred, okay, we'll great. hear from you. Thank you. Um, yeah, interesting comments. Uh, could, could touch on, on all three panelists. I'll start with uh, Kaysan or Kassad's comment about um, choice. And I think, I think it, was, uh, it, was a gr it was a great comment, and I think it's something that we in the government are trying to work with the tools that are, were referenced in allowing consumers to have more choice. So over at our booth, we have a program at, called Fish Watch. Gov. And, and, and it's a website that has information that allows you to learn, one, the source of your seafood, two, whether that's a sustainably fish and stock seafood, and a bunch of information about the non-target things that are caught, the bycatch that Nora mentioned. Um, but the choice also extends to other aspects of, of your life in terms of how we interact now with our planet. Many of you know that 
the ocean is, is under stress, whether it's climate change, whether it's pollution, whether it's pesticides and runoffs. So as seafood consumers, you also have to extend that ethic to other aspects of your life to help the ocean and to help the fishermen. Fishermen are usually the downstream users that get piled on with the regulations, but a lot of things happen upstream that affect the ability of the ocean to keep producing sustainable fisheries. So I think the call out is, is, is to make those choices and, your, and the way that you go about supporting restaurants, supporting businesses. Ask them where your seafood is from. Ask them if, if it's from a U.S. fishery if it's imported. You, you, you have that right to know and there's the tools that they should be able to tell you. And if they don't, then find out why not. Thank you very much. Nora? Yeah, so I think that the, you know, what you ended on there is really, is really key from, from our perspective, from where we are as purveyors in the industry is, you know, we approach it largely from an education standpoint and helping consumers make an informed decision, like, much like um, we have with um, fishwatch.org is having the tools to really feel like you are making an informed um, decision so that you're driving driving change in a positive direction like we hope to see and you know something that we talk about in terms of the traceability um, we hear a lot about the negative things that are going on in our oceans from climate change stresses of overfishing um, we have all of these issues in supply chain now in seafood that have come to light with slave labor, which is just another issue that is, you know, another kind of negative in the, on, the, on the seafood pile of negatives. Um, but what we're really about is, is bringing to light the positives in the seafood industry, what all the U.S. is doing in terms of our really sound management, what all fishermen here in the United States are doing to really lead sustainability across the world and, and allowing consumers to access to that information. So when you are going and you're saying, where does my fish come from? You should have an answer. Traceability should be, um, you know, industry wide. And I think that we have this pretty extreme lack of accountability in the seafood industry where we've seen accountability measures put in places in place in many other industries in agriculture and a lot of big business, but we just haven't seen it um, on a large scale in, in seafood. So we're working to change that. A lot of industry members are working to change that, whether it's through implementation of technology, of innovative technology, whether it's through more collaboration, whether it's through disrupting the supply chain, buying directly from fishermen the way we do and being able to um, kind of circumvent to be able to reward fishermen financially for doing a good job and for fishing responsibly. So I think there are a lot of ways that we can creatively attack these problems that we're all you know, hearing about and come together so that everyone can make that informed decision. And the solutions are absolutely out there. And I think we're all taking those great steps towards you know, making improvements in our fisheries and in our oceans at large. Thank you. Cassidy. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that was just said. And I just want to follow up on that point about accountability. Uh, there's a couple different levels I think, when we're talking about accountability and, and from our sector, from the restaurant, the restaurant world, uh, it needs to be mentioned. The first part is, is again, being able to make the choices and making the right choices. But the second part is not what the choices are, but who is making them. This accountability piece has been missing in our sector for a very long time. And it has been put directly on the shoulders of the consumers and that is not fair. It is not fair. We that work in the seafood industry are paid for lack of better words by the ocean. Things that come out of the ocean in one way or another end up as our paycheck. And I believe and our restaurant really is founded on the principle that that means we should be the ones being responsible for it. Our customers come in and they have their own lives, they have their own jobs, and they don't have the time to think about seafood sustainability, which is an incredibly dynamic, ever-changing landscape, eight hours a day, like we do, because we are literally paid to think about fish. So they come into the restaurant and they wanna do the right thing, they wanna make the right choice, and overwhelmingly, the information they're giving is, well, you have to educate yourself. I don't think that's right. I think it's a stopgap. I think it's what we have to do right now because in reality, the people that should be making these choices, the restaurant owners, aren't. I had a conversation once not too long ago with a sushi chef that is uh, 
very, very well known. And it was a very disappointing conversation because we were trying to get him to remove a very endangered species, bluefin tuna, from his menu. And he said, well, I'm not going to take it off, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, uh, I'll put a little asterisk by it and say, you know, for those that are concerned about bluefin tuna, you know, you should be aware that, that there are some concerns around it and, and uh, you can go and get more information. I'll put it on my menu and people can order it if they want and, or not order it if they don't. And I said, that's not, that's not going to do it. And he said, why not? And I said, well, because you put bluefin tuna on your menu. You didn't put overexploited, endangered, full of mercury bluefin tuna on your menu. If you want people to actually hold that responsibility, you want to put the onus on your consumers, give them all the information. All of it. You're the only one with the information. You need to take the responsibility for this. So I think when it comes to that point about responsibility, about who's going to shoulder the burden, I'm sorry that it's falling on consumers right now. It should be on us. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're so, ready. so one of the main aspects of responsible fishing and making sure that the consumer has a good, healthy product is something that a lot of people don't think about. And that is the enforcement issues of the regulations that fishermen are supposed to deal with. 50% of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's budget goes to enforcing uh, the enforcement branch of the department. That spread out over the terrestrial and the ocean environment. California is a big state. California has a very long coastline. When the wardens go out and get a good solid arrest on somebody, a bad guy, I'm not talking about a little tiny paperwork violation or something, but somebody's out there over exploiting uh, the environment. And it goes to court, and this fisherman just gets a slap on the hand. He stays in the fishery. It might cost him a few bucks. It's important that our district attorneys, our judges, prosecute these guys to at least a misdemeanor level so that the bad guys can be taken off the ocean. All right? It's also important to have these traceability things. In 2004, a group of uh, sea urchin divers approached our Department of Food and Ag here in California and the legislature to form the California Sea Urchin Commission. California Sea Urchin Commission is, is, part of, is now part of the Department of Food and Ag. We are a state agency. I have to follow all the rules of the state agency. Uh, but we did this in order to sustain a healthy sea urchin industry. We wanted to have that kind of, of uh, interaction with the rule makers, with the scientists, and we want to do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that was positive, in a way that was well financed. When, when we attend meetings like this, some people are paid to, and not this panel so much, everybody here is probably on their own time, but any time I go to a meeting or participate in, you know, the, uh, some panel, uh, it's, I do this on my own time. This is not my job. My job is to fish, all right? So when we talk about sustainability, we have to talk about enforcement. We have to talk about traceability. We have to talk about the good science that the managers need to make informed decisions. You know, when you look at the current guys that are on our California Fish and Game Commission, right, they're not marine scientists. Our California Fish and Game Commission has to deal with everything that starts at the top of Mount Whitney that goes out to three nautical miles along the California coast. All right, they're smart guys. Nobody's that smart. They need to have good input from some of the people that are on this table, whether they're, you know, for sustainable uh, sushi bars, uh, working as marine scientists, or fishmongers, <laughs> which I have a friend who's uh, a noted scientist, and she would love to have her job. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, thank you.
Very good. I think uh, we can take some questions from the audience now. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Uh, Sarah here will bring a microphone to you. Just raise your hand and stand up and make some noise if you'd like to ask a question. Got one here. The uh, mislabeling. How, how as a consumer do I get information on that? Can you put your microphone up a little oh, closer? I'm sorry. The mislabeling that you talked about, mm -hmm. how as a, you know, as a consumer do I get information on that? Would you like to handle that? I, I can I can start. Uh, thank you for that question. And the the issue of mislabeling seafood fraud is is actually a very hot topic right now in 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 the, in the federal government circles. In fact, the president has uh, constituted a task force that has recommendations. And and so there, this traceability that that all the panelists have have referenced is 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 something that's going to have budget. It's going to have a lot of work behind it in the coming years. And. So I, I think Kaysen's point is, is, is a good one that, you know, we need to give you the information so that you're, you're able to make some decisions both on the restaurant end, on the government end, and then still on your individual end, you need to ask every plate of seafood or every menu choice you make, you need to ask. And so this, this traceability from hook to plate or from net to plate is some of the more encouraging types of activities that are happening now. And I think in the coming years, we're going to have a lot more transparency and a lot more light will be shined on seafood that doesn't meet the standards and is coming in where our U.S. fishermen have already paid the cost of this transparency in the pound per seafood that they get and the pound per seafood that you buy. And we're trying to level the playing field by making sure that foreign sources pay that same cost. Just real quick, uh, one of the things the California Sea Urchin Commission has done in cooperation with the Department of Food and Agriculture is we have joined and we are now in the process, we're early into this, it's only been a few months, but we are part of the California Grown Label. So in the, in, in the coming months and years, you're going to see more and more places that serve sea urchins, uni is what it's called, that have that California Grown Label someplace in that restaurant. Uh, most of the urchin you will get here in California right now is from California. When you go throughout the United States, most of it is from the United States. On the East Coast, a lot of it comes from Maine, right? But you need to know where your seafood comes from so you can make educated choices. And that does not mean that everything that comes from overseas is bad, all right? We know some of it is. We know some people are trying real hard overseas. But you know that they say you hold people's feet to the fire and then you get results. And that's, I think, what some of the other panelists are talking about. Thank you. Cassidy, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, first and foremost, Bob, I got four restaurants that are, would be so happy to put that label up. You just, you just tell me when. Um, one of the reasons that that's exciting to me is because I would, I would venture to say that when it comes to traceability, our little tiny slice of the pie is the worst. The, sea, the sushi industry is a mess for a bunch of different reasons. When it comes to traceability, it is nearly impossible to figure out what you are getting and where it is from. It is worse than ordinary seafood by an order of magnitude, and that is saying something. One of the reasons that it is so difficult is because you have to deal with a language barrier. So to answer the gentleman's question, in our space, probably one of the most difficult challenges is mistranslation. Uh, a lot of reports have come out talking about lack of transparency in the industry, fraud, things like that. I wouldn't debate that. But in our little piece, fraud, I'm sure it goes on. But it seems like a little bit of a harsh word for what is in reality just kind of inertia. When uh, sushi came over to the States in the 60s and 70s, right here in Los Angeles, the first place where it landed, um, we didn't really understand it. You know, we didn't have any connection to the culture that, that created it in terms of as it expanded. And so we just kind of copied what we saw on the menu, this kind of like list of fish, and then it just expanded. That's why you can get the same nine-piece sushi lunch in Duluth, Minnesota, Miami, Florida, Des Moines, doesn't matter where you are. Um, it's because it's not coming from the principles of sushi. It's coming from a replica of what it looked like at one particular time in, in Los Angeles. And uh, it wasn't just the fish that got copied. It was also the words... And over the last 40 years, we have gotten significantly better in the States about actually talking about the fish that we mean 
Uh, there's a lot of different market names and things that have been confusing, but hasn't really percolated into the sushi industry. So you look at a menu in the sushi business and you're gonna see a lot of mistranslations. It's nobody's fault and nobody's trying to deceive you, but you'll see something like Hamachi, Hamachi Yellowtail. Hamachi is not Yellowtail, it's not. It'll say that on 99% of all sushi menus in the country, but it is not Yellowtail. It is the same genus as Yellowtail, but it's a very different species from a very different part of the world. and has a very different set of environmental problems attached to it. So as again, as a stopgap solution, this is not the way to save the world, the way we've got to do it in the industry. We have to fix this. But just for now, to get around these problems in the Japanese sushi specific corner, you got to learn about six or seven Japanese words and what they actually mean and not look at the English on the menu. I can uh, give you a list of those words after this, tell you what they actually mean. That should do you, uh, do you some good. The, uh, the, the mislabeling problem, the fraud problem, as pointed out um, by Craig, is getting a lot of federal attention at the moment. And I think if we look at the history here, it's been a relatively short time span over which we've really gotten excited about this. Uh, I can tell you that in the early 1980s, uh, myself and a colleague, an ichthyologist colleague, were walking down the pier in Monterey Bay. You know, they have the fish samples out there, the fish out there to sell fresh fish. And we're looking at this one uh, set of, of fillets uh, labeled swordfish. Uh, well, my ichthyologist colleague looks at this and he says, that's not swordfish, that's shark. And this was before shark was at all considered to be a palatable dish. But we pointed it out to the vendor who immediately took his fillets back inside and waited until we left the pier before he brought them back out. There are two major problems uh, with this mislabeling. One is uh, the issue of selling fish and not noting whether it's wild or farmed. And the second is the swapping of species names or species. Uh, we've heard both of those issues are going on. And I should also point out that in a 2010-2012 report uh, where actual DNA testing was done, of 1,215 samples from 21 states and 674 different outlets, as Kasson pointed out, uh, the mislabeling was found to occur in 74% of the sushi uh, enterprises that were checked, 38% of the restaurants, and 18% of the grocery stores. Uh, and that of among the 12 U.S. cities and areas that were sampled, Southern California had the highest percentage of individual samples that were mislabeled. So we'll hear more about the mislabeling, about the accountability, I think, as we move into the future. Another question from the audience. I know one of the answers that people have posed for sustainability problems has been farming. And yet, we're hearing all kinds of pros and cons about farming at this time. That there's mercury poisoning, there's horrible feed going into it, it's you know, not desirable nutritional quality. Do you guys have an opinion on that? I know you do, but. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see if one of you want to say some things about this, but let me, let me start by saying that in 2013, uh, aquaculture provided close to 50% of the world's supply of seafood. Um, the numbers you'll hear vary around that particular, that particular value. And as was pointed out by Bob, I think, uh, more than 90% of the U.S. seafood is actually imported. And of that amount that's imported, uh, about 50% of that is coming from aquaculture. In other words, it's farmed. And of that aquaculture amount, uh, about two-thirds of that is coming from, from China. So aquaculture has been on the docket for some number of years now as being a possible way to provide continued amounts of seafood. There are efforts going on to try to certify sustainable aquaculture practices. We have a way to go on this, including figuring out the scientifically best ways to actually farm species so that there's minimal impact to the environment and that sustainability is achieved. 
Craig, I know you have some thoughts on aquaculture. Do you want to comment? Sure, thank you. I think you covered, you covered some of the statistics, but I think we need to be careful in not painting a broad brush across all aquaculture as we do with all fisheries. And aquaculture has come a long way as well, and I'm referring more to U.S. aquaculture and, 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 and really the, the environmental standards now we at NOAA Fisheries and the states as well have, you know, siting standards. There's, there's, there's standards in terms of effluent and feed. So there are some reputable, you know, aquaculture operations that are supplying a viable part of our California, our U.S. seafood, and they could have the label of California as well. And I think they, they, sh they, they should be given their due that they have joined, you know, more responsible business practices. Having said that, do we have work? Of course, there are aquaculture operations that do come at a cost. And again, the cost that we internalize with our U.S. businesses is not necessarily the same cost of these foreign imports. And that is where we're trying to level the playing field in, in, in that regard. Any other comments on the aquaculture enterprise? Yeah, I have some comments. Uh, of course, we're a wild uh, seafood uh, uh, sea urchin here in California. That doesn't mean there are, uh, I just met with a gentleman a few weeks ago who is a Japanese Canadian and through a group of people in Norway, he has developed uh, a feed to supplementally feed sea urchins. When we do that, it's no longer going to be labeled wild caught. What we're trying to do right now is see if this is financially feasible, one thing, and what the end product will be, another. That means we're going to have to do nutritional analysis. We will have to make sure that we can do this in an environmentally friendly manner. Uh, if you try to do it out in the open ocean, uh, it can get a little problematic, especially here in Southern California, where every section of the ocean, somebody's got dibs on it. So it's, uh, it, but it's something that we are looking into. Like, the, we can't just paint that broad brush on, uh, on aquaculture. Uh, especially here in this country, the people that are developing aquaculture are trying to be very responsible why? Because they have various forms of our government looking over their shoulders. These same standards do not exist in many parts of the world. So, again, this is why you need to know where your seafood comes from. Now, several years ago, I saw a video that came from a country, that, aquaculture, from a country that I'm, I spent a little time in in my misbegotten youth. And I can tell you, if I showed you that video, you would never eat seafood that was grown there again. Uh, but sometimes ignorance is bliss. Uh, so this is why when they talk about knowing where your seafood comes from is very, very important. Kasson, do you have a word? I think aquaculture is another opportunity for us to be thoughtful. Uh, it brings with us a whole host of new challenges, but it's basically the same thing when you get down to it, it's whether or not we're gonna take responsibility for the way that we're creating our food. Um, instead of how we catch fish, it's how we raise fish, and that's different mathematics, and different impacts, but it's the same thing. It's, are we gonna go into it being honest with ourselves about what we're actually doing or not? There's wonderful aquaculture products out there. There really are. And there's some pretty dubious ones, too. Um, it gives us a really interesting opportunity to, to reboot the way that we think about seafood. A lot of the things that we're trying to farm right now are top of the food chain carnivores because we are used to eating them from the ocean, wild caught things like, like tuna. Um, and when we put them in an aquaculture situation, it really doesn't make any sense. You know, it's the, the whole kind of like growing the grass to feed the cows and then throwing the cows to the tigers and eating the tigers situation. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's a great opportunity for us to break those cycles down and think, well, wait a minute, why are we trying to farm this? What is it about this that we like? One of the beauties of nature is that it provides us with so many different amazing creatures to learn from and understand. If we want to grow fish, we should start from there. We shouldn't start assuming that, well, we're going to find a better way to produce this because this is what we like. We should start from what kind of fish lends itself to the kind of growth that's good for us as a society, it's good for us as a planet? What can we put less protein into than we get out? What can we grow in a way that keeps the water cleaner? 
It doesn't make it dirtier. What's already there? Nature isn't broken, you know? Aquaculture, a lot of, time, a lot of times it's like there, there's this idea that nature isn't quite right and we gotta fix it by building a better mousetrap. Nature's not broken, nature's perfect. We're trying to fix it, we're the ones that are misled. Thanks, Nora, let's hear from you. So I'll be quick, I just have a few, because like you, I, I also, you know, you have those questions about aquaculture. You hear a lot, as you do with wild captured fisheries, there's a lot of problems and as a consumer, it, it can be overwhelming, particularly with um, the amount of negativity that's out there and, and you just don't know how to be informed. Um, the way that I kind of think about aquaculture is kind of how I've come to think about agriculture in light of the organic movement. And you know, when you think about small scale farms and, um, and consumption, there are large scale aquaculture operations that we're buying this incredible amount of aquaculture um, produce product is, is feeding 50% of our seafood demand. That's really powerful and that's gonna continue to grow. Um, so I think that traceability of figuring out, you know, did this product come from one of these small operations? We have um, folks here from Abalone Farms and you probably had uh, Grassy Bar Oysters today. Those are small family run operations the way you wanna buy off of, you know, family run fishing vessels. There are those equivalents you know, throughout wild fisheries and aquaculture and throughout agriculture and aquaculture. So again, not to beat a dead horse, it's, it's, it does come down to knowing where it came from. And to Cassin's point in terms of um, the efficiency or lack of efficiency when we're trying to raise tuna in net pens, um, you know, a kind of a rule of thumb when you're talking about eating an, a farm-raised uh, seafood is eat low on the trophic chain. Those are low impact, incredibly efficient protein sources. So eat something like, like oysters, like abalone, like mussels, um, something that has low impact on the environment. You know, good, good science is really important to learn how to do aquaculture in ways that are environmentally friendly and sustainable. Uh, one of the things that we're looking forward to is uh, all to see being able to provide uh, venues for some scientific work to be done in the aquaculture arena. And most surely one of those will be developing multi-trophic aquaculture systems. This is where you tie together the raising of fish with mollusks with seaweeds. This is being done in Asia, it's being done in New England. And the basic premise is that uh, the wastes that are generated by the fishes, which of course are valuably harvested for food, are, are processed by mussels or bivalves. Uh, and the mussel and bivalves, which secrete nitrogen, is taken up by the seaweeds. Of course, the mussels and bivalves are food. The seaweeds, such as some of the red algae, produce very, very uh, valuable products. Um, and figuring out the best way is to link all these together and basically to come up with a sustainable system is important. And as I said, I think we'll see some of the uh, enterprises where science and commercialization go together to create scale-up opportunities through the all to see venue. I want to, uh, we'll, we'll, we have one more question we can take from the audience. We have one more person out here who'd like, like to ask a question. Okay, I have two, two particular, we got one over here, one more. Hi, <clears throat> I have a, a, a question and actually maybe a little bit of a statement or explanation. I've been hearing about <clears throat> the, um, that there's a very uh, questionable merit for, for uh, growing tuna. We've been, <clears throat> I've been involved in the tuna farming, the tuna ranching operations for, for many years and with a lot of experience in aquaculture. So one, one point I just want to bring up, when you hear about, you know, sometimes you hear out there that there's <coughs> the um, FCR, the food conversion ratio for tuna is 15 to one, 15 pounds of, of sardine will, will, will grow one pound of, of tuna. That's true, it's between 12 and 15 to one. And, it's, and it doesn't seem like a, a massive amount of fish to grow one pound of tuna. Um, I would like to point out that in aquaculture, you really need to compare apples with apples because I, for many years I was a shrimp biologist, a growers in shrimp, 
and we're talking about 1.5, 1 to 1 kind of food to risk ratios, you're talking about a dry pellet comparing that to a wet shrimp. In, in, in this, when you're talking about tuna, you're feeding a sardine, which is a, which is a, is a 75% water, to, uh, and, and so the true for the food conversion, when you're talking about how many pounds of feed, if you're gonna compare that with, with tuna, say with shrimp, is more like three to one, four to one. But that, again, is not great FCRs, but it is a gourmet product. But there are some things out there that, that sound um, spectacular, but really when you compare the science of it, it's, uh, it, 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 well, I'm just saying you have to compare apples with apples. Um, again, from the marketing side, you're talking about mislabeling. We do have, um, there was a lot of product, I think in the sushi, but I'm, I'm, I'm correct if I'm mistaken. The, um, a lot, wasn't a lot of the mislabeling of like the 70% mislabeling coming from mostly one species that's been that was that was that was miss uh, like the, the white tuna the escola they called white tuna they found that in all the sushi bars because they were all the basically all the korean sushi bars were mislabeled that and that's a little mis and misleading in a sense that not 70 percent of all seafood in sushi bars is mislabeled is that 70 percent of the sushi bars had one item that they were calling it incorrectly as you pointed out yeah snapper snapper and tuna are by far the most mislabeled of, of the fish samples that come through and were found that way. Um, okay, I, I'd like to, um, to wrap this up, but I have two, two questions that I'd like to throw out. One, I want Nora to make a comment uh, from her perspective about the principal reason that Salty Girl exists. Okay, that's an easy one to answer. Um, talk about our, us. So Salty Girl Seafood was founded by um, a very small team of uh, students at UCSB, a handful of women at UCSB, myself included. And we were finding all of these problems in fisheries and seafood and trying to think creatively about how do you solve them. Um, my coworker Gina is here and she was down in Madagascar doing work there in fisheries there and my co-founder Laura and I were in the fisheries in Galapagos and, and we kept hearing over and over from, from head scientists and from um, you know, leaders in the field saying we're really missing this key link which is the buyer to drive sustainability, the market-based incentive to say to fishermen we're going to incentivize you financially to make this change. We know that top-down regulation can be really a, a hardship for a lot of fishermen. You know, this can be, in, and in some places, you know, the guys were talking about, um, you know, in America, we have the enforcement. Sometimes it's an issue, but in a lot of places around the world, enforcement is a huge problem. So how do you go into a place and incentivize people to change behavior towards responsible fishing with the market, with a market-based incentive? So that's why we launched Salty Girl. Um, and now a huge part of what we do is connect people more closely with their resource. We are ocean lovers. We love to be in the water. We love fish. We love fishing. We love seafood. We love the fishermen we work with. So to bring that to our consumers every day, to, to be able to go online and trace their fish through our website or see the actual fishing family who harvested their products. Actually, Rob and Tiffany sites are here today, South Bay Wild. So um, to create that connectivity, um, you know, to bring the ocean to people is just kind of full circle for us. Okay, the last, the last thing that I'd like the panel to, to take a crack at here is we often get this question from folks when it comes to issues like this, and that is, what can I do as an individual with respect to this issue? So, Cassin, you want to make a comment about that, and then I'll let any other of the panelists say something. So, what, what are your suggestions? for the audience out there, what can they do? Well, I got two. One that I think is what we should do in the short run to address this problem now, and then one that I think speaks more to what we should do in the long run to address this problem for good. And I'll, uh, I'll take the, the, the second one first. If we really want to fix this problem as consumers, we have to transmit our desire to fix this problem to the people that are selling us fish. 
full stop. We have to do that. Um, the uh, industry is responsive in many ways, and it will listen both to voices and to, to checkbooks. If you're going to a restaurant where you don't feel you can trust the fish, stop going there, please. Talk to the chef. If the chef won't change, stop going there. It's just not enough. We become complicit in these kind of decision making. If we say, well, I care about this, but you know, I'm too busy. I don't want to talk to the chef. Or the... Yeah, I know. I get it. And, and frankly, from our perspective, we're too busy too, you know, to have that conversation all the time, but we have to have it. We all have to have it because it's critical. If you have a chef or a purveyor or a market where they are doing their job, let them know that it matters. Go there, tell them that you're going there because it matters. So that's, the, that's that part. It's just a transmission, both of the information and the money. The other part, the shorter part, is about actually dealing with the sushi industry on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really, really tough. Um, to go into a sushi restaurant today and order sustainably is really, really tough. So I'm going to give a really quick cheat sheet. Um, we call it the 4S rule. If you can remember four words that start with the letter S, you're going to be in pretty good shape. The first word is small. Order small fish at the sushi bar. It'll usually take you towards things that grow more quickly, that are more, uh, it's kind of more available. Larger populations, there are gonna be lots of exceptions to this, but it'll basically put you in the right way, right place. It'll also keep you away from fish that have a lot of mercury. The second word is seasonal. Order off the whiteboard. Don't order off the printed menu. That'll keep you out of conventional aquaculture. If it's gonna be on the whiteboard, it's probably because they're getting it from a localized and seasonal wild capture source. The third word is silver. This is the weirdest one. The Japanese have a term, it's called hikari mono. It means served with the silver skin on. This is applied to a number of fish that are actually very good, healthy and sustainable choices. Mackerels, horse mackerels, uh, half beaks, shads, things like that. They can be a little bit interesting and a little bit challenging at first, but it's some of the best food in the sushi industry and it's full of omega-3s, so you're gonna love it. And the last one is shellfish, go for it. It's a good kind of aquaculture. It's going to denutrify the water. It's a good way to get protein from stuff that we can't eat. So oysters, clams, scallops, that kind of stuff. So yeah, four words. Small, seasonal, silver, shellfish. If you can do that, you're in good shape. Thank you. Do you anybody else want to say a word or two about this quickly? Yeah, just a word or two. Uh, you know, as far as talking to the chef is concerned, I have a friend of mine that uh, owns a, a restaurant in the Napa Valley called Hurley's. His name is Bob Hurley. And he spends a lot of time going out between the kitchen duties and, and interacting with his customers. And he asks them all kinds of questions. And he wants to know that they are satisfied with what he is producing. Any good chef will listen to you and talk to you. If they don't want to talk to you, probably you should go someplace else. But the most important thing is you need to educate yourselves. That's just a life lesson anyway. Just don't take everybody's, what you read in the newspapers, it just gives you a direction to go and then do some, do your own research. It, uh, uh, I think it'll open your eyes. Okay, and I'll just be brief. I, I think what Kasson said about seasonal and being a, from a fishing family here in San Pedro and get to know your fishermen. Get to know those in your community that are selling seasonal products. There's been a lot of talk about the restaurants and the chefs and the chain of command and the fishmongers, but start at that point source. Get to know your fishermen. They'd be happy to talk to, happy to, talk to you. Thank you. So I want to remind you that Kasson will be available to sign his book. The book being uh, Sustainable Sushi, A Guide to Saving the Oceans One Bite at a Time. Be down there on the right side. We don't have lots of copies of the book available, but you can arrange to have that book uh, purchased and signed by, by Kasson. Last two words, last two sentences. First, seafood is the most highly traded food internationally. And second, the US is the second largest seafood consuming country in the world after China. We eat a lot of seafood here in Southern California. Hopefully you've learned a lot about how to look at seafood from a sustainable perspective. Let's give our panelists a hand. Thank you very much for being here on behalf of all to see.